um, it's a great pleasure to have, um, I should call him professor because, <laughs> yeah, professor Jeff Pennington. Uh, uh, his earlier affiliation was Stanford University, obviously from there he did his PhD. And now he's immediately getting uh, to join uh, at uh, UC Berkeley very soon, within August. And uh, wishing the best of luck for that. And many, many uh, warm wishes from all of us. And uh, yeah, like um, we are very grateful that you uh, agreed to give the talk. And this is the 27th QSTM seminar. Uh, so you are the 27th speaker. And uh, uh, his uh, expertise is uh, on basically connecting quantum gravity with quantum information theory. He did many work on quantum error correcting code. Last one year, he was involved in this black hole information uh, issues. And he had some particular contribution on that. He's going to talk about uh, some of the aspects in which uh, uh, like uh, he's working and already worked on. Uh, uh, so yeah, like, uh, uh, and oh, so one more thing, he is going to be the associate, associate professor of IAS Princeton as well. So congrats again for that. So uh, Jeff, you can start from your side. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot for, for having me give a seminar. Um, so I'm just planning to, to review a load of ideas that have been, you know, very influential and large fraction of the, the work I've certainly done since I, I started my PhD five years ago. Um, and yeah, I think they've been very influential in the field of, of ADS CFT and quantum gravity over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, so these ideas really start with paper by Ryutaki Naki back in 2007 or so introduced this thing called the Ryutaki Nagi or RT formula. Um, so that was a formula for the entanglement entropies of boundary regions in ADS CFT. Uh, it's a formula that's been generalized in various, in various ways since. So the sort of HRT formula, uh, maximin prescription, uh, Quantum extremal surface prescription, various other ways. Um, and also a lot of other stuff happened related to it. In particular, the, the first paper it should really be described as more of a conjecture than, than um, any well established result. Um, but there was a very famous derivation of this formula. I'm so good at this using the pen thing. Um, by Lukovic and Maudacina in 2013. And that form derivation has also been generalized a lot since. Uh, so that derivation uses something called the replica trick. So we'll explain. Uh, so then there's also a closely related idea that sort of came out of the Ryutaki Nagi formula called entanglement wedge reconstruction, EWR. Um, which basically is about if I have some boundary region in the CFT, then what information about the bulk does that, that reduced state in that boundary region contain? Um, so there's sort of a load of work being done on this. Uh, in particular, I'm going to focus on showing you can do entanglement wedge reconstruction using something called the PETS map. Uh, and finally, sort of over the last year or a bit more, one of the, the sort of major applications of these ideas has been to the black hole information problem. Um, so hopefully I'll talk a bit about how this connects to that. Um, so there's sort of various buzzwords that have become associated with this, the idea of islands, uh, the idea of replica wormholes, 
space-time wormholes connecting different replicas together. Hopefully that will make more sense later in the talk. And then of course there's the old idea that this ties into, going back to Lenny Siskind in the 90s of black hole complementarity. Okay, um, and really those three buzzwords are just the, the applications of the three sort of bullet points above. Um, so islands are just really, you know, what you get when you apply the, the RT formula and its generalizations to evaporating black holes. Um, replica wormholes are the, the way the replicatric derivation works in that context. And black hole complementarity is really just a special case of entanglement wedge reconstruction. Um, when, yeah, when when you're considering evaporating black hole and the source and radiation. Okay, um, so that's a sort of very broad picture of, of some of the things I want to talk about. Uh, we'll see how far I get in that. Um, but I'm going to start just by talking a bit about the the Ryutakinagi formula and what it says and what it means. Um, okay, so let's start with. Start with very bad drawing of the boundary and bolt in ADS CFT. So we have some space time, which looks like a can of soup, of course, famously. Um, and on the, the boundary of this space time, the boundary is has has a fixed conformal structure. Um, and on this boundary, you can think of there existing a, a CFT. Uh, and that CFT is equivalently described by quantum gravity that with dynamical geometry in the bulk of that space time, i.e. geometries with, with a boundary that looks like um, you know, asymptotic boundary that is, is, is the, the boundary we've put the CFT on. Um, so the Rio Takinagi formula and the, its original formulation said the following. So let's consider a static like a static state of the CFT. This corresponds to a, a static space-time geometry. Um, so we can consider just a, a cut or a static slice. I apologize for my inability to draw circles on my iPad. Um, and now, so this is, this is just a spatial slice through this static uh, quantum gravity state geometry. You know, if it's ADS, then it just looks like the hyperbolic disk, but uh, in general, it's dynamical, so it can be different to that. And we can then ask the question, what is the entropy of some region of the boundary of this state? Uh, so in particular, so in red, you might want to ask about sort of some, let's make it, the boundary be be one plus one dimensional. Um, let's take my boundary region to be sort of the union of two two intervals, uh, and I'm going to call that big B. Okay. Um, so then the rule that we and Taki introduced for calculating this entropy is that you look for the minimal area surface that is anchored on that boundary. So in this case, it might be, for example, a surface that sort of starts here, goes over here. Similarly, we need something anchored on the other end of this boundary. So it's start here, go over here. And then it says that the reduced entropy of B of this region is given at leading order by the area of this surface. I'm going to call this surface chi divided by four times Newton's constant. So this should be reminiscent of the beckinson hawking entropy of the black hole. And indeed, we'll see it's closely connected to it. Um, but yeah, this is the rule. Uh, but as I've stated it so far, it's sort of only applicable in very simple situations. And the first way that you would want to generalize it, um, or like clarify it as maybe a better term for this, is that um, 
when I, I need to be precise about what I meant by a surface anchored on this boundary, right? Um, so let me move to a new slide and give another example of a, a state where we might want to apply this rule. Uh, and that's what's called the thermofield double state, which is a thermal state on each of these two boundaries where the two states purify each other and they purify themselves each other in a particular canonical way, which is just you have your reduced dense, thermal reduced density matrix e to the minus beta h and the sort of square root of that you can equivalently consider uh, as a uh, state in two copies of the Hilbert space. It's an operator from the Hilbert space to itself, so that is equivalently a state in Hilbert space tensor its fuel, uh, and this is the thermofield double state. It's a state on two copies of the CFT, and its bulk dual is a uh, Einstein Rosen bridge a wormhole, two sided black hole, non traversable wormhole connecting the two sides. Okay, um, and now one could ask to compute the entropy of sort of the left-hand side of this. Jeff, why you have chosen the thermophile double state to be the row to the power half? Just to like, uh, like uh, it is two copies, that's why? Yeah, uh, the, you mean why is it row to the half rather than row? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. yeah so, so you want the state to be normalized. That means you want... Okay. Uh, you want rho to the half, rho to the half to be one. Okay, okay. Uh, and that equivalently means that you want trace of rho. That's equivalent to trace of rho. Yeah, yeah, one, yeah. Right, because we have two yeah. rho to the halves here. Exactly. Um, the, the, actually, that's, that's just a, that's stupid. That's just normalization. The real thing you want is that you want, okay. when we trace over the right-hand side, say, uh, of row to the half, row to the half, you want the reduced state to be uh, e to the minus b to h. And you get that even only if, if the, the original state was row to the half again, because you have two copies. Okay, okay so, so depending on what you meant by uh, anchored on this boundary region, uh, you might think you know, this boundary region you've chosen is sort of closed. It doesn't have a boundary. You might think that the, the entropy is, is zero, um, but that's not the right sort of formal definition of, of that term. What I mean by anchored at the boundary is something called the homology constraint. Uh, so what I mean is that I want the union of the boundary region B and this bulk surface chi to be um, itself the boundary of some bulk spatial region, which I'll call little b. Okay, so in this case, um, the, the boundary region itself, even though it's closed, is not the boundary of any bulk region because in the bulk we, we have a, a connected geometry that connects this other boundary. So in fact, the sort of minimal area surface uh, that satisfies this homology constraint would be a sort of loop around the throat of this wormhole, right? So if I do that, then uh, the union of the, the red boundary region and the blue RT surface is this sort of left-hand side of the geometry. Um, and, and, you know, it, it is the union of those two is the boundary of that bulk surface, so it satisfies the Okay, um, so this is a general formula min of a chi for g Newton, satisfy the homology constraint. It's a general formula that will work at leading order, uh, ignoring quantum corrections and for static states. Um, but we now know how it generalizes to sort of include both non-static states uh, and to include um, quantum corrections. So that's what I'm going to talk about next. 
uh, start with how it generalizes to non-static general time dependent states. Um, okay, so let's draw a time dependent space time. So, you know, we maybe have some some stuff sloshing around in the middle here. Maybe some things are scattering off each other or something. Who knows exactly what's going on? You have some, some heavy matter that's like distorting the space time in a time dependent way. And I guess the most obvious guess, if you really hadn't thought about it hard, would be okay, now we don't have sort of some preferred spatial slice in the space time, right? So we don't have a uniquely defined notion of time. So maybe sort of the, the right thing to do, given some boundary region is to just find the smallest surface homologous to that boundary region going through the bulk, just, just do any slice. Um, but if you think about this for two seconds, you realize that's sort of stupid because I could just imagine some surface that sort of jumped backwards and forwards in time along, along light-like directories, trajectories, and it would have zero area, right? So clearly that's not going to give a, a very sensible answer. Um, so, the answer instead, proposed by Hubermini, Rangamani, and Takinagi, is that you don't look for surfaces that have minimal area, you look for surfaces that have uh, extremal area. So, uh, yeah, just surfaces where, where, as I vary the surface, then uh, the linear change in the area will be zero. In general, these will be smooth, um, but there might be more than one of them. As before, so let's again have two regions. You might have a surface, extremal surface that sort of looks like this, and then also an extremal surface that is also homologous. Instead, connects things together like that. Um, and uh, so you're meant to look for all extremal surfaces. And then you just meant to take the smallest one of them. Uh, so there is a minimization that's just over the sort of finite number of extremal surfaces. Um, so this sort of prescription was yeah. given a very. I have a question just. Yep. Uh, for, for, uh, like, so minimization with respect to what? Yeah, the, just, the, just the space of surfaces that satisfy this homology constraint that the union of the boundary region. And chi is itself the, the boundary of some bulk okay, region, okay. some space like bulk region. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, and so, so minimization is just that, that you take the one with smallest area out of the ones that are at the, okay. Of the area. Uh, okay. Um, so, this, this was given a sort of very nice intuitive definition uh, that sort of unifies the two steps of the minimization and the extremization. Um, by Aaron Wall, um, what he said is the following. He said, rather than first looking for sort of all extremal surfaces in space-time, let's just pick some choice of Cauchy slice that includes this boundary region. I don't really mean Cauchy slice here because it's an ADS space-time, so there's no such thing as a Cauchy slice. But I mean what people call ADS Cauchy slice, which is just a, a sort of space-like slice of anchored on this boundary region, okay? And we're just gonna consider an arbitrary slice. And then within that slice, we're gonna, as before, look for the minimal area surface. So within that slice, that's a sensible thing to do. It can't, you can't just make it be zero by making it sort of zigzag along light, light cones um, because you know, for an arbitrary surface, the, the light cones won't be in the surface. Um, but then we need to make it covariant. We've just picked some arbitrary slice. And the way we do that is we instead maximize this minima over all Cauchy slices. So called C. Okay. So this is called the maxi min rule. Um, and yeah, the, it can be shown that these two 
Descriptions are, are completely equivalent, assuming that nice things about the space time. Okay. And um, okay, so the 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 final generalization we're gonna need is gonna be that we also have quantum corrections, this formula. This can be thought of as just the, the classical part. Um, and these quantum corrections come from the fact that we have quantum gravity in the bulk, not just, just classical gravity. So in particular, we have sort of matter fields that are uh, floating around. Uh, and those matter fields are going to give a contribution to this entanglement entropy, S of B. And uh, really, the, the contribution they're just going to make is that this area over 4G Newton is going to get a correction that is just going to be the bulk entanglement entropy of chi. And when I say the bulk entanglement entropy of chi, so we had B and we had chi. Chi is a space-time co-dimension to surface. Uh, then the, what I really mean by S bulk of chi, this is just a notational thing, but it really refers to the von Neumann entropy of all the bulk fields sitting in this region B, which lies between the boundary and chi. Okay, so you can think of this term as sort of a quantum correction to the area. Uh, this was originally, this term was originally introduced by Fogel and Lukwitz and Marcina uh, in 2013, but they sort of had it outside this extremization, and then Neto Engelhart and Alan Wall argued that it actually really should be inside. It should be treated completely the same level as the, the area term, just added to it in sort of every step in the process. Um, and again, this can be found using a, a maximum prescription that was done by me, Neto Engelhart, Chris Akers, and Nikki Rikoskic uh, last year. Um, but yeah, okay, so that is the, the sort of most general version of the, the rear attacking Nagy formula. Um, so unless that everyone has any sort of questions about that, this is the, the quantum extremal surface prescription. Um, could also be called the, the Engelhart wall formula, but Netter and Aaron have written too many papers together, so that just gets confusing if you start calling anything Engelhart and wall. So it's normally called the quantum extremal surface prescription. Um, Okay, any, any questions about like what this, this sort of formula, this rule for entropies is, uh, and you know, the corrections, anything like that. Otherwise, I'm gonna move on to talking about how you actually derive this rule. So guys, if you have questions, please ask Jeff. Uh, yeah, I have a question. You mentioned yep. that there was an equivalence uh, of min x with uh, yep. max min. Is yep. that still the, the case with uh, the bulk entropy? Uh, yes, yes. Again, so yeah, the the yeah the maximin for in the quantum extremal surface prescription works exactly the same way. So again, max over C over Cauchy slices of minima min of chi in that Cauchy slice of exactly the same formula. Um, yeah, so that works exactly the same way. You 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 have. Yeah, you know, this this the equivalence of the two requires some assumptions, something called the quantum focusing conjecture. Uh, and you know, we 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 know less about semi-classical gravity than we do about classical general relativity. So so that's not a statement we can make with as much confidence in the classical case. Case, but um, well-established conjectures uh, suggest that the the two are again equivalent. Okay, okay good. Thanks. Great. I have another question. Yep. Uh, uh, is there a prescription for the regularization of S bulk so that in some way it matches? Yep. Yeah, that's a great question and actually something I, I should probably have talked about. Um, so, as you rightly point out, uh, entanglement entropy in quantum field theory is divergent, right? Uh, so, in fact, the leading divergence is proportional uh, to the area, for example. So the, the, this S bulk, 
if people aren't familiar with the term divergence, this S bulk is, is formally infinite, right? If I, if I, I need to regularize my quantum field theory by introducing a cutoff length scale epsilon, and then um, this S bulk of chi is really the, the sort of leading order thing looks in fact like A of chi, well, A, let me forget about chi. Let me, let me just say I have some arbitrary, arbitrary region in a quantum field theory. Let's not talk about quantum gravity. Uh, I'll just call the, the region R. Then actually the, the sort of leading and in fact infinite contribution to this, this entanglement entropy uh, is given by the sort of area of the boundary of R uh, divided by this cutoff length scale taken to the power D minus two so that we have, have the same units on top and bottom. Uh, entanglement entries are a, a unitless quantity. And then we also have subleading divergences. So what on earth does this mean? We've added this infinite quantity. Uh, how does that make any sense? Well, the answer is that if I look at sort of your know, bare UV quantities, then then this G Newton is also infinite, right? Uh, G Newton needs to be renormalized, and the leading divergence in G Newton uh, is also proportional to one over epsilon to the D minus two. Uh, and again, here we have an area, um, and so uh, yeah, actually. The, the sum of these two things is called the generalized entropy. And it is actually, you know, there's very strong evidence at this point that it is in fact UB finite, that all the divergences get renormalized away uh, by, by this area over 40 Newton term, in addition to what's called Hyatt curvature terms, which we also have in, in general theories of gravity. Uh, and so yeah, they, this sum is in fact well-defined, even though both the terms within it are. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Great. Okay, so I now want to talk about how you derive uh, all these formulas. Um, I'm going to base. I'm going to work with Euclidean space times, uh, not Lorentzian. Um, so, uh, that means I won't in fact really be deriving the HRT formula or just be, be finding that you, the, you get the generalized entropy of the, the minimum quantum extremal surface in the Euclidean space time. Um, that is really just for ease of, of, of drawing. Um, the, you can just go to Lorentzian space times by just analytically continuing, uh, and when you do that, then, then we would indeed get sort of HRT and, and Lorentzian quantum extremal surface prescription. Um, but Lorentzian geometries, and in particular, uh, complex geometries, which is actually what you end up with, are, are hard to draw. Um, and so I'm not really going to worry about that part. If people have questions, I can answer them. Um, but I am going to include uh, Quantum corrections, I'm going to derive the quantum extremal surface version result because it's not much harder. And really, derivation um, is going to involve three steps. The first step is going to be converting this sort of entanglement entropy, which is what we, we want to find, into something that can be found calculated using a boundary path integral, okay? And it's really gonna be the analytic continuation of a boundary path integral, but we'll get to that in a minute. The second step is where holography is gonna come in. We're gonna convert the boundary path integral to a semi-classical bulk path integral. We'll be semi-classical because these formulas are meant to apply when G Newton is very small. Um, 
which is the limit where, where gravity becomes semi-classical. And finally, I'm going to use a trick, which I'm going to call the, the lukovitz maldacena assumption. Um, so the lukovitz maldacena trick uh, to evaluate this semi-classical bulk path integral and, and get our answer. Okay. Uh, so that's going to be the next while of the talk because it's a it's a it's a technical uh, calculation that involves uh, a load of steps and, and it, one big trick. Yep. I have just one uh, question that you mentioned that the, the it can be analytically continued to Lorentzian, but is it just uh, uh, that so easy to do that in Lorentzian? Um, pretty much. So so yeah. Well. Uh, like the the way you sort of extend it to Lorentzian is you consider states that are prepared using Euclidean path integrals, but then are, are involved in Lorentzian time, right? Like generally, the the part of the ADS CFT dictionary we understand best is how, in terms of how to prepare states, is that how the, to prepare states using a Euclidean path integral on both sides. Um, and so when you do that, you, you have a path integral that sort of has some Euclidean pieces and has some Lorentzian pieces. Uh, and because you have density matrices, then you have sort of a forwards time evolution, you have a backwards time evolution, called Swinger Kuldish contour. Um, and then it, it really does just end up being, yeah, so you still have Euclidean geometry there, you just also have some, some Lorentzian bits. Uh, and so it really is just like, a, a, yeah, it's the Euclidean thing, but with some some complex values of t showing up at various places. And other than that, it, it does just go through exactly the same way. Okay. Uh, in the bulk, you just have to analytically continue the, the geometry in the complex plane. Um, yeah. Uh, so the short answer is, is yeah, there, there really isn't anything terribly insightful there. It's just kind of confusing until you wrap your head around for a bit. So I don't want to have to go around deal with it. It's just easier to draw the yeah, it's easier to visualize the Euclidean version. Okay. Um, so step one is to convert this, uh, convert the entanglement entropy into something I can compute with the boundary path. And that's actually really quite hard for the von Neumann entropy, right? So the von Neumann entropy S sub B is given by minus trace of rho B hat by hat. I'm going to use hat to show that density matrices are correctly normalized of rho b log rho b, okay? Um, and I don't know about you, but if I'm shown log rho b, then I have no idea how to compute that using path integral. Uh, but that's okay, because I know how to compute something else using path integral, which is just something called uh, a integer n Rainy entropy. Um, so that is given by this formula, 1 over 1 minus n, the log of trace of rho b hat to the n. Okay, so this is just determined by this trace of rho b. Yep. The replica trick. Sorry, say that again, you were breaking up there. But... No, I'm saying that this uh, you can actually calculate using replica trick. Uh, Yes, so 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 the replica trick. You, you mean you can calculate the entanglement, the von Neumann entropy using the replica? Yeah, trick. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. So so, but the replica trick is is you know I mean I'm explaining how to use the replica trick. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm saying you can't directly calculate it. There is no path yeah, integral so that directly you, gives you, you need to rho log rho. Rho entropy and then from that. So say that again. No, I'm saying that first of all you have to calculate the Renai entropy, and from that, yeah, you can exactly. Yeah. Then, 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 we, so yeah, we, we, we're going to use this calculation of S n, and then yeah. So the the next step is to note that the von Neumann entropy, just using L'Hopital's rule, is given by the limit n goes to one of this Renai entropy. Okay, so, so this for, for integer n, say n equals two or n equals three, then this, this Rainy entropy can be calculated because it's just the, the trace of 
a power of reduced state stage symmetric, so that's something you can compute with a path integral. Um, and then if we can get a formula for Sn as a function of sort of all n, even non-integer ones, um, then we can take that formula and we can take the, the limit as n goes to one and set the von Neumann. Okay. Um, yeah, if it's not obvious to people why that's true, just just apply you know, both the numerator and denominator become zero as n goes to one. Uh, and you can apply L'Hopital's rule and you just get exactly the one line. Okay. This, so there's sort of, I have another question. Yep. Sorry, uh, like <clears throat> the thing is, I know that people used to calculate uh, von Neumann entropy to, uh, to compute about uh, the entanglement, but uh, why particularly this measure? Because there are these days in quantum information theory, there are a lot of measure available. So if someone asks you that if you are expecting uh, this uh, entanglement is non-zero, then which one is the good measurable quantity? Good, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so one answer is that the, the entanglement entry, the von Neumann entropy is, um, the simplest thing to calculate that is sort of a, a good measure of entanglement, at least for pure states. Uh, another argument is that it turns out to have this nice bulk dual, so it's a, a useful thing to calculate from the bulk point of view. Um, but yeah, it, it, it turns out in fact that for a pure boundary state, um, then at least a leading order for a general semi-classical semi -classical bulk state, uh, the boundary entanglement spectrum. So, so for a pure, a bipartite pure state, uh, then the entanglement is entirely classified. You know, I have some state psi and I have a reduced state. For B, okay, the, the entanglement the sort of full entanglement properties of that bipartite pure state are characterized by the eigenvalues of, of rho b. Uh, that's called the entanglement spectrum. And it happens that for semi-classical states with a nice semi-classical bulk dual, um, that all these sort of eigenvalues, call them lambda b, of this reduced density matrix, they're like e to the minus the von Neumann entropy, plus some sort of subleading thing. Uh, little o there means that it's, it's like parametrically smaller than okay, SB. Okay. Um, so, so sort of all the entanglement properties of the state are, are really determined by this entanglement. Okay. At least it isn't. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, so, okay, so, so if we can calculate trace of rho to the n, then we can uh, plug that into this formula and we can eventually hope to get the von Neumann. So our first step is gonna be working out how to uh, use a path integral to evaluate trace of rho to the n. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? Well, each rho is a sort of trace over b bar of the pure state psi, okay, and we have a bra and a ket, okay, and I'm going to assume that this sort of global state psi, maybe like the vacuum state or something, can be prepared by a Euclidean path integral. So for the vacuum state, it would just be prepared by doing the the CFT Euclidean Euclidean. Not doing very well here. CFT. Euclidean path integral on like a hemisphere, right? Um, so this, this will just prepare the vacuum state sitting on this equator. Uh, so that can say be the ket in this trace of V bar of psi psi. And we also need a bra. And we need n copies of this, right? So. So here's our n copies of rho. 
well, here's our n copies of Tetsai and our n copies of Grassi. We haven't really made made them reduce density matrices yet. And okay, so the, the first step is to go from this sort of global density matrix, psi psi, to the reduced density matrix rho b. Okay, how do we do that? Well, we just need to take a partial trace over b bar. What does a partial trace correspond to in a path integral? It just corresponds to, to gluing stuff together, right? So we just glue, say, this region and this region in the cat to their corresponding parts in the bra. Same on each of the other copies. So we now have n copies of Reduced density matrix. Um, so once we've done this gluing, these things will become just a big sphere with sort of a couple of holes cut out of them, right? A couple of the, the, the B parts have not been glued together. So we now have, yeah, a load of spheres. Okay, um, uh, so that gives us n copies of row b, but we now want to turn this into trace row b to the n. Uh, so again, we're going to be gluing stuff together, this time the b regions. Um, but in this case, we're not sort of taking the trace of each one individually. We're taking you know, row b to the n, so we're sort of you know, matrix producting them all together. Uh, and then making a trace, so that turns it into a sort of cyclic matrix product. So what we're doing is we're taking, say, this part and this part in this ket, and we're gluing them into the bra sort of one heat round in the cycle. And then we're gluing this part here to these things over here. And then these ones get glued back to complete the cycle back into these things here. Okay. So when we glue everything together like that, we end up with just um, a, path, uh, a partition function, path integral on like, uh, a closed manifold. So that's just going to be a number, a number that is trace row to the n. Um, note that at this point, the rows are not normalized. Um, so this just gives us this number z. Uh, and in principle, if we could do CFT, strongly coupled CFT path integrals, large n, uh, just directly, then we could just evaluate this and um, get entropies. Um, and in fact, for say one interval or something, you, you can do that. Um, uh, yeah, so so uh, if we want to evaluate the rainy entropy, we need trace of the normalized density matrix to the n. So if we call this thing Zn, that is going to be Zn divided by Z1, right? And you've got to normalize by dividing through by trace of row uh, to the power N, okay? So that is the, the boundary thing we want to compute, but for, for general complicated boundary regions, this, you know, even if in, in one plus one dimensional CFTs, this is going to be some complicated high genus Riemann surface, and that involves a lot of data about APEs and stuff. It's hard to directly compute. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the ADS CFT dictionary to convert it into a bulk thing that will then let us, uh, yeah, um, let us evaluate. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I had a small question for you. Yep. Uh, I heard somewhere that the replica fit is not valid in cases where there are in the replica symmetric spaces, meaning. We need that we need the manifold to be to have some kind of symmetry, say, uh, rotate. Uh, sorry, you're saying we need the boundary manifold to have some kind of rotation symmetry? Um, I don't think so. Uh, that the the when we go to the bulk, there's going to be assumption an assumption we make that that I will talk about in a minute about uh, the replica symmetry not being broken. Um, but I think for any state that can be prepared using the Euclidean path integral, um, 
then we we can just just do the path that, yeah we the the this description for finding trace of road to the end uh works and if we are able to evaluate it for all n then we should there should be a unique analytic continuation that has appropriate properties uh to be give the the full answer for all n so i think i think this approach will work for arbitrary states um yeah uh okay um so how how does the ads cft diction work um well at a simple level it just says the following it says that the sort of boundary partition function is just equal on some uh boundary manifold m uh with yeah boundary manifold n uh with let me just write this again okay partition function on the boundary on some manifold m with some currents j uh, or just general like geometry j includes sort of the geometry of the boundary um, boundary conditions j uh, is equal to just the bulk partition function where we integrate over yeah where, where we integrate over all manifolds with the same boundary conditions i just write that as mj again um so we yeah do in principle an integrate integral over sort of all metrics and so on uh whose whose asymptotic boundary uh looks like the geometry and has the, the field configurations and stuff of the uh, uh cft uh, path integral um of course in general the the gravitational path integral is not likely to be very well defined um we'd expect it that the theory has to be completed in the uv by some string theory or something else uh but it's certainly probably not going to be pure uh gravity in high dimensions or pure gravity plus quantum field theory because uh, that we think doesn't make sense um but it, when we have a uh, small g newton then we can approximate this z bulk by we can call a semi-classical path integral um which is just going to be the following thing it's going to be e to the minus classical gravitational action some metric z g times what i'm going to call z matter of g which is just going to be the um qft path integral of the the low energy matter fields and in principle also like graviton fluctuations and stuff in uh that background that classical background with geometry g um and uh this sum over g is just going to be a sum over geometries uh where we have functional derivative with respect to the metric g is of uh, e to the minus i of g and the matter partition function equal to zero okay um so this is just a sum over semi-classical saddle points of this action so we're doing the full path integral over the matter fields and in principle over fluctuations of the metric but we're just summing over saddle points of this semi-classical approximation and that this functional derivative being zero is equivalent to the semi-classical Einstein equations being true um yeah so so this just equivalent to semi-classical einstein equations i've included the cosmological constant in my energy momentum tensor uh that just the yeah the curvature of space time is just given sourced by the expectation value of the the um the energy momentum tensor for that euclidean uh euclidean geometry with those boundary conditions okay um and uh, so I wrote a sum over G here, but really this, this Z is gonna be dominated by whatever saddle point G uh, maximizes 
this quantity e to the minus i t times that mass h. Okay. So then the uh, okay. So so in general, uh, these geometries are hard to find, um, even for something like uh, pure ADS three gravity. If arbitrary n, we we don't really know what they look like beyond numerically. Uh, we don't have an analytic form for the the full geometry. Um, so it seems like it's going to be a really hard challenge to try and find these geometries, including say the, the back reaction in the matter, uh, and then get the, the sort of functional form for all n and then analytically continue it. Uh, but there's this very clever trick that you know, really is the cleverest thing I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to call the lukovic maldacena assumption. Uh, and what they did is they observed the following. They noted that in the boundary path integral, you have a Zn symmetry. What is this symmetry? It's just the symmetry that takes the n copies of the of rho and it cyclically commutes them around. So trace rho to the n is, is traces a cyclic, so we can cyclically commute all, com, commute all our rows. Uh, and so we have a Zn symmetry in the, the boundary path integral. Okay? And the assumption, um, which turns out to be pretty valid in most circumstances, is twofold. Um, the first is that the dominant saddle, in the dominant saddle, this symmetry uh, is also a symmetry of the bulk. So this symmetry is not spontaneously broken by the dominant bulk solution. And the second assumption is that uh, the, the dominant saddles are all you need. So you can, you can just, the sum over saddle points for each n, you can just drop everything except the, the leading saddle. And that, that will give you, already on its own, give you a nice analytic function of n. So this is not, the second assumption is, is in some ways the, the riskier one because it's not always true. You can have sort of phase transitions that happen at, at different values of n. And so you have different geometries dominating for different values of n. Um, but uh, it, it's pretty valid in a lot of circumstances. I'm just going to assume it. Today. Okay. If we accept these assumptions, um, then uh, what we can do is we can look, rather than looking at the full uh, geometry on the sort of n with n boundaries, we can just look at the geometry we get when we quotient uh, the full bulk geometry by the Zn symmetry. Um, and because we know that this, this full geometry is replica symmetric, uh, that quotiented geometry is almost enough to tell us what the full geometry looks like. Uh, there's only one more thing we need, which is we need to know where the fixed points of the replica symmetry are. Uh, why? It's because in the quotiented geometry, these are going to correspond to branch cuts. Um, so let me explain that. Okay. So. In the quotiented geometry, for the case we had earlier, where we, we were just looking at the vacuum, uh, then the, the sort of boundary, the boundary just looked like a sphere, right? But on the boundary, we have these regions, make up region B, where if I sort of start on the boundary here, and then I go through a little loop where I go backwards through this red region and then come back up to where I started. Then I'm going to end up on a different sheet to the one I'm started on. Okay. Um, so, uh, right, the, the, if in the full n sheet geometry, then going around in that little loop will take me to one sheet from one sheet to the neighboring sheet. It's the way I glued things together. Um, so, when in the, the bulk quotient of geometry, um, 
this still has to be true because the boundary conditions of the bulk were the, the boundary. Um, so if I go around the sort of same loop very far out near the boundary, then I again have to change sheets. Um, and in fact, what has to happen is you have to have a surface in the bulk that sort of continues this branch cut. So it could maybe look like sort of a surface like this, a surface like this, such that if I go in a little loop in the bulk around this surface, then I, I end up one sheet over, right? So that all the different um, sheets get glued together around this surface. Um, okay. Uh, so, yeah, in general, this sort of quotient of geometry is going to look smooth everywhere in the bulk, except at these sort of fixed points. So why did I call them fixed points, by the way? It's because they're the points that are preserved by the, the ZN symmetry, right? Because I, I, everything got glued together at, at this point on the boundary. So uh, if I apply the ZN symmetry this point in the quotient of geometry, um, then in the unquotiented geometry, I'm not like gluing together a load of copies of this point. There's actually only one copy of this point. Everything got glued together around. Uh, so that's why I call them fixed points. Um, You're assuming all the fixed points or the branch points are simple. Uh, in the boundary, they are um, like the the you know we 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 constructed the boundary and we just have this this fairly simple like branch cut structure um, mm -hmm. in the quotient version. Uh, and I'm assuming that that simple structure just continues to the bulk. You could, yeah, there's probably all sorts of other weirder things that can happen, but um, I think that's a less problematic assumption than the assumptions I made above, uh, partly because I'm writing a paper right now about how the assumptions I made above can fail, but um, also I think it's just true. Um, but yeah, I agree. In principle, some very weird things could happen. Uh, just going to assume that doesn't happen in the dominant, dominant geometry. Okay, so so... Uh, the important point to make is that um, in this quotiented geometry, if the original geometry was smooth, this quotiented geometry will look smooth everywhere except to these blue surfaces, right? Because in these blue surfaces, then in the unquotiented geometry, you sort of had to loop around the surface n times to get back where you started. And that means after you quotient, you know, if I imagine I had sort of a little plane around a point, and now I quotient that into sort of n pieces. Right, so this, this point is preserved by the, the Zn action, but all these wedges get sort of moved around into each other. Uh, then once I do the quotienting, then here is going to get glued to here, and I'm going to end up with a conical singularity at this fixed point. Okay, um, so yeah, if the unquotient geometry is smooth, the quotient geometry will have conical singularities. Um, but the key point is going to be that we can write the the semi-classical action of this unquotient geometry in terms of the data of the quotient geometry. Um, so. One level, this can be just written formally. So the data of sort of GN, I'm going to call, use that for the quotient of geometry, and chi N, which refers to the fixed points, uh, yeah, it's just equivalent to the unquotient geometry. So I can just say that I N of GN and chi N is the, the action of the unquotient geometry that has that quotient. And similarly, we have Z matter is determined by GN and Kaya. So that's just sort of a trivial rewriting. Um, but we can actually think about what this action looks like. Uh, so the first thing to note is that if you ignore the local contributions from near the fixed points, chi N, um, then the sort of gravitational action of the, the full unquotiented geometry is just N times the, the sort of naive gravitational action of the quotiented geometry, right? Um, because the gravitational action is local and we really do just have n copies of this, this quotiented geometry. 
uh, but that's that's not quite enough on its own, not quite right on its own. Um, because as I said, for example, the quotient geometry has a singularity when the unquotient at the fixed point, when the unquotient one doesn't, and vice versa. Uh, so we, we have to be careful about what's going on at the, the fixed point. Um, so if I just had n copies of the quotient geometry and they weren't glued together in any way, uh, then the contribution I would get from this fixed point is n, because I have n copies of it. Uh, I'm going to use phi to represent the, quotient, the, the opening angle of the fixed point. Um, so conical singularity just gives an action, an Einstein-Hilbert action that looks like phi minus 2 pi times the area of that fixed point. Um, so that's what we would get in the unquotient geometry. This is sort of part of this sort of n times uh, the the action of the unquotient in geometry, but what we really want to have, which is the the glued together unquotient in geometry, um, doesn't have n copies of that surface, each with opening angle phi, has a single copy of that surface with opening angle n phi. Right. So what we really want is n phi minus two pi times a pi over forty newton. Okay, so we need to add to this n of phi. We need to add minus this plus this. Um, nicely enough, this makes the phi cancel out, so we don't have to worry about that. It what that is, and we just get n minus one times the area of this surface chi over forty newton. Okay, so that's starting to look like the sort of thing we might want. Um, And the other thing we might want to notice is that this set of matter, set of the matter fields in the unquotiented geometry uh, can also be written as a quantity in the quotiented geometry. In this case, what is it? Well, it's just a trace of the reduced state of the matter fields on uh, region little b, which remember is the region bounded by big B and chi, is everything in between these two. The trace of that to the power n. Again, row B here is unnormalized. Um, but why is that? Well, that's just how the bulk is glued together, right? So we, we sort of, the way the bulk glued together is like you have a, a bra, Preparing a state on, kept preparing a state on this this entire thing, and uh, similarly, bras preparing states, and you have n copies of each, and they get glued together. So this region, little b, gets glued together cyclically, uh, while the sort of rest of it just gets glued together with the same copy. That's exactly the same thing we did on the boundary earlier to prepare trace of row to the n using a part. Okay, so this thing really is just trace of row b to the n. Um, and the final thing we need to note is that the full unquestioned geometry being a saddle point of uh, the, the gravitational action, i.e. having a d by dg, and the unquestioned geometry being zero, is equivalent to two things being zero, Changing the quotient geometry and uh, moving the moving the fixed point. Okay, so we want our, our functional derivatives of both those things to be zero because changing either one of them changes the unquotiented geometry, uh, but also you know. They together determine the unquotiented geometry. So if we keep them fixed, then you know, there's no every change in the unquotiented geometry is a change of at least one of these things. Okay. So what we're going to look for is uh, uh, eventually solutions of Zn that satisfy these two equations. Okay. So now the beauty of everything we have done so far 
is going to come in. Namely, we have this formula that then e to the minus n times the action we get that particular geometry minus n minus one times the area chi in this geometry times the trace of the reduced state of the matter fields. Okay, this whole formula we have now uh, we now don't have any need to have n be an integer. Okay. So, so when we were looking at things in terms of the unquotiented geometry, then non-integer n wouldn't make any sense at all. It was just complete nonsense. But now we've written everything in terms of a quotient geometry g of n and a fixed point chi of n. And so now we can just have n be absolutely anything we like. Okay, so that's really going to be the beauty of, of our assumptions that let us, let us do this rewriting. Um, so in particular, we can plug in z equals one plus epsilon, and then take the limit epsilon goes to one and work to linear order in epsilon. Okay. So okay. I have a question about, uh, uh, do you know how many fixed points uh, you have? Um, so because no, it, it might also be possible that there are no fixed points. You have uh, coverings without uh, uh, fixed points as well. So the, um, because the the boundary conditions have fixed points, uh, then you need to have a surface chi n that is homologous to the the, the boundary. Uh, okay, so these fixed okay, so that's a good point. So these fixed points would actually lie on these homologous surfaces. Yeah, the the fixed points are going to end up being the the quantum extremal surface. At the moment, we just know that there's some surface homologous to the the. The boundary region. I should have emphasized the fact that they're homologous to the boundary region. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, well, the the reason I use chi for them as as for the quantum extremal surface is going to end up being the quantum extremal surface. Okay. Um, okay. So so how do we evaluate z one plus epsilon? Well, let's just work first to zero order in epsilon. We just get uh, the result for z equals one which is just e to the minus i of g of it, g1. Okay, so that's just the, the you know, the, the, the g1 at this point is just the ordinary thing you, geometry you get if you just evaluated, say, trace of the density matrix. Um, and we have a trace of row little b, which is just said matter. Okay, so that's leading order in epsilon. Uh, we now want to expand about it to, to linear order in epsilon. Uh, so we've got to look at all the things that depend on n. Uh, okay, so first thing we have is that we have an n dependence in front of phi 1. So that's going to give us an epsilon phi 1. Okay. Second thing is that g of n can depend on n. So we're going to get an epsilon. So this should be a partial derivative, not a functional derivative. But the epsilon times the derivative of g of n with respect to n times the, uh, the derivative of the action with respect to g of n. Um, Okay, so the, the third thing we have in n dependence is this n minus one times the area. So that just gives us an epsilon times the area of chi one. Uh, and then we need the, the dependence from this sort of uh, trace of row little b to the n. Um, and remember that this is this thing evaluated in the geometry geometry g of n. So this, in fact, has two ways in which it depends on n. Uh, the first is just as before. We have uh, the change that we get from the, the variation in g n. 
so this gives epsilon. We now no longer have this Z matter, so I'll, I'll put a one over Z matter here. Uh, I'll put a derivative again, Gn with respect to N. And we have the change of Z matter with respect to N. And finally, um, we have the, the dependence on this N inside the trace. Uh, and so that is just going to give us uh, this is going to have a plus sign, unlike most of the others. Actually, these should have had plus signs, sorry. That was a typo. Um, no, that one should have been a minus sign. Got it right eventually. Whatever. Um, so this is just going to give us a trace of rho b log rho b. OK. Um, OK, so the first thing that we want to note is that the uh, at n equals 1, the action does not depend on the location of the fixed point, chi 1, uh, because you know, the, the Trace of rho b doesn't depend on what little b is, just because it's the, the trace of the whole state. And the m minus 1 times the error is just 0 there. Right? This is really corresponding to the fact that if I just have one copy of the geometry, then there's no, there's no branch cuts, because I don't have any branches. Um, so the, the location of the surface chi n, or the surface chi 1, is not determined uh, actually at Chi one, it's just it's going to be determined by the the linear order in epsilon corrections to this, right? Sorry, I, let me yeah, um, let me save that. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, the first thing I actually want to note is that uh, because we have the derivative of uh, the action times we we impose the semi-classical Einstein equations, then we know that d by dg of the gravitational action plus one over that matter d by dg of z matter is equal to zero. This is literally the equivalent to the the semi-classical Einstein equations. Um, if I put a minus sign here, which I meant to do. So these two terms just magically vanish away. So that is a significant simplification. So we're just left with these three order epsilon terms. OK, uh, but it's going to get even better. And it's going to get even better because we don't just want z1 over epsilon. We want to divide that by z of 1, to the 1 plus epsilon the normalization. Uh, so what is z of 1 to the 1 plus epsilon? Well, again, zeroth order in epsilon is exactly the same thing as before. But in this case, we just get 1 minus epsilon I want a g plus epsilon log z matter. OK. So that's just because you know, the dependence in epsilon is very simple. You're just taking z1 to a higher power. Uh, but now we can combine these two together. Damn. I'm out of whiteboards. Can I? How do I close it? Anyone know how to close whiteboards? Sorry, say that again. Sorry, I, I can't hear it all, I'm afraid. I don't know if it's my problem or 
Uh, have I been clear through this? Is, is my audio been cutting out at all? Because I've been struggling to hear people. Uh, I'm sorry, the connection is a bit poor. I yeah. don't know how the area term coming in the question session. Uh, I wasn't able to follow all of the details. So, which part were you unclear on? Okay, I, I, I'm afraid I can't hear, so I'm, I'm just going to go on. But if you, yeah, uh, just feel free to ask me afterwards or possibly send in the chat or something. Um, okay. Uh, so we final answer. So Z1 plus epsilon over Z1 to the power 1 plus epsilon, which we call is the thing we're going to need for the von Neumann entropy, is the firstly the 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 e to the i1 z matter cancels out in the top and bottom. So we're just left with some things that are linear and epsilon. Z1 minus epsilon chi over 4g. plus epsilon. We had a, a trace of rho log rho over z matter. So that is trace of normalized rho times log of non-normalized rho. And then finally, we had a minus epsilon, uh, epsilon log z matter, which may seem slightly stupid, but I can write as Trace of rho b hat times log z matter, just because trace of rho b hat is one. And um, and these two to combine together to just give one minus epsilon a chi four g plus epsilon trace of rho b hat log. So we get this beautiful simplification and we get an an the answer for S for Neumann entropy, which we call is just the limit as epsilon goes to zero of minus one over epsilon uh, log z1 plus epsilon over z1 to the one plus epsilon. This is just a chi over 4g plus s bulk chi. So it's just the generalized entropy of this surface chi. The only thing we're left to do to finally get the, the quantum extremal surface prescription as we want is that we need to argue, we, we, we need to work out what the surface chi is. Okay, but this is actually very simple to do because when uh, n equals one, as I said before, then uh, the action doesn't depend on chi. Okay? So demanding that this is a, a fixed point of the uh, the action and the variations of chi for z close to one means that we we need to have it be a fixed extremum of the the order epsilon uh, chi dependence in the action. But that is just given by exactly these terms here. Uh, so we find that chi needs to be an extremum of the generalized entropy. In other words, it needs to be a quantum extremal surface. Um, and more than that, we wanted to take the, the dominant saddle. We wanted to take the, the, the thing that the, the G and the chi that gave the largest action. Uh, so we want to take the out of the quantum extremal surfaces, we want to take the one where this is smallest because uh, that's the one where, where this Z1 plus epsilon of Z1 to the one plus epsilon is largest. Um, so that's the, the, that's the one we want. Um, so we are done. Uh, yeah, we get the quantum extremal surface prescription. Great. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully I didn't lose people too much in that. Um, but really, this sort of yeah, the 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 deep trick is this idea that you can go from the unquotiented action where you had to have n be an integer to to reformulate it using these certain assumptions in a way that it, it just everything was in terms of the quotient geometry 
And then we could go to arbitrary n. And then when we got n very close to one, then everything became, you know, was, was controlled by the, the original geometry, g1, without any back reaction. Right, so for, for n equals two, the, the geometry G2 is just totally different from the original sort of saddle point geometry. But when we take the limit n goes to one, we get back the unback reactive thing, so everything simplifies a lot. And that when you look n near n equals one, the the um, the action is dominated by the generalized entropy of this quantum extreme set. Okay. Um, Feel uh, feels ridiculous to be by hand erasing whiteboards when on Zoom, but I guess it is in keeping with tradition. Okay, uh, so that is that is um, the the derivation of the quantum extreme surface description, which honestly was the the main thing I really wanted to cover today um, because it's sort of too in depth and and technical to sort of typically be covered, but I think it's a really beautiful and deep result and all the exciting stuff about black hole information and so on, like really the heart of it is Lukovic Madison. Like that's the that's the deepest thing going on there. Um, the sort of deepest insight is 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 the fact that that works uh, the way it does and that these replica tricks like calculations simplify so much. Um, but there are a couple more things I want to talk about. The first is entanglement wedge reconstruction. Um, I'm not going to go into too much depth about this, but I want to get the, the basic ideas across. Um, OK, so. Um, sorry, could I ask a question about the derivation? Yes. So yes. Uh, hi, how is it that we got quantum corrections here if we only included um, saddle points in the uh, gravitational path integral? Yeah, so, so good question. I, 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 I maybe should have made it clearer. The reason I was writing e to the minus the gravitational action, but then I had z matter, is that that z matter included the full path integral over the matter fields uh, in that um, saddle point geometry, right? So it's a, a semi-classical calculation where we treat the low energy matter fields as fully quantum mechanical. And include, you know, really this is coming from a one loop correction, so we're including the one loop correction to them. Um, so that wasn't super explicit. Uh, but um, yeah, the, the, the matter fields we were treating quantum mechanically, we just weren't trying to do the full path integral over the, the metrics because that way madless lies. Um, but really, Z matter should include all fluctuations, so it also includes fluctuations in the metrics. So really, it was, we were doing like a one loop calculation in, in, in practice. I just tried not to write it that way because I think it, it confuses rather than clarifies. Um, okay, is that clear? Uh, yeah, thanks. Great. Uh, okay, so what is entanglement wedge reconstruction? Well, it is an answer to, you know, if, if the quantum extremal surface description is the answer to sort of very specific question of, of what does a boundary entanglement entropy correspond to in the bulk? Entanglement reconstruction is in many ways the more fundamental question of uh, if I have some boundary subregion, how much of the bulk does that tell me about? Uh, and the answer is it's very closely related to the quantum extremal surface prescription. It's just that it's the entanglement wedge. And this is just the domain of dependence of little b. So what is little b? Recall that the, it's just the, the region whose boundary is um, b and chi, OK? And if, if, if we're not in a static geometry, then that B is not very well defined because it depends on the choice of spatial slice, uh, but its domain of dependence is independent of, of what we use, what we, we call little b. Uh, so this is a well-defined thing that depends only on, on the region B and the surface chi. Um, so let me try to just give a go at my very poor drawing skills, trying to 
represent this. So let's say I have my region B, just a little bit at the edge here and a little bit at the edge here. Then maybe um, chi is just this and this. And in this case, the entanglement wedge would look something like this. Basically, the sort of wedge in the space time that goes up from light sheets yeah, from this surface uh, towards the boundary. Um, okay. Um, and yeah, we could also want to ask about the, the entanglement wedge of, of the sort of complementary region here. So in this case, it's going to look roughly like a sort of tent. Um, so we'd have like this, like this. Again, get causal diamonds on the boundary. And we get sort of a tent sitting in the middle of the bulk. Um, don't take the exact shapes of those two literally, but at least the, the topologies are right. Um, okay, so the, the claim of entanglement wedge reconstruction is that everything in those, those green and blue regions are encoded in their respective boundary region. Um, so let me make a, a more precise statement of that. It says, let me just draw, go back to spatial slices because they are vastly, vastly easier says that if I have any operator by little b sitting in the bulk, then I can find an operator, it may be a complicated operator, by big B that only acts in the region big B if little b, the, my operator phi little b is in the entanglement wedge of that particular boundary. Okay. So this claim, if you're not too careful about it, might seem paradoxical, as pointed out by, by uh, Almiri, Dong, and Harley um, back in 2014. Um, so uh, here's why. Uh, so let's say this is true. So we have some phi B that acts on sort of this black region. We could also find a phi B that sort of acts on this red region. Right. Um, and we could find a phi B that acts on this blue region. Because in each case, uh, the, the operator in the center is contained in the entanglement wedge. Um, but if that was the case, then it seems like phi, this operator, phi little b, has to commute with everything on this region has to commute with everything on this region, because that's not in the black red thing, and it has to commute with everything on this region, because it's not in the red region. So that means it commutes with all local operators on the entire boundary, you can have these things be slightly overlapping, and that means uh, the, the only operator that commutes with every operator, every local operator in a Hilbert space, is the identity. So we seem to have concluded that phi little b is the identity, which is really not what we wanted. We wanted it to be a non-trivial bulk operator. Um, so, so how does this make sense? Uh, the answer, which again, you draw Miri, Dong, and Harlow, is that this operator phi little b only makes sense for a particular set of states. What are they states? They're, they're states that have this semi-classical geometry, right? If my state is instead a giant black hole that looks like this, uh, then there is no sense in which that operator phi little b is well defined. Okay, so we only want this operator to do the right thing in a particular code subspace of states. Code subspace is a very quantum information y word, but it literally just means a subspace of states with, um, which have this particular semi classical geometry um, and that we can meaningfully talk about the operator in. Uh, and then what you see is the, the, the statement about um, 
this file little b commuting with boundary operators is really just a statement that uh, for states in the code subspace, then we can quantum error correct the erasure of any one of these three regions. Um, so you know, error correction means that even if I lose access to some information, the information is encoded in a redundant way and so there's still access to it. Uh, and you can have that for quantum computers. It's one of the things that makes quantum computers possible and so powerful. Uh, and yeah, um, you know, that's how this should be understood. I'm not going to go into any more detail about it. Um, it's a bit too tangential for what I'm going to talk about. Uh, but it's a useful point to make because it's going to motivate how I'm going to justify entanglement wedge reconstruction, which is going to use something called the PETS map. Um, so the sort of original arguments for entanglement reconstruction, uh, which were, I guess, by Jaffris, Madacina, Jaffris, Lukovitz, Madacina, and Sue, but then more, more formally and rigorously by, by Dong, Harlow, and Wall, um, basically just took the, the quantum external surface prescription, or even just the, the Ryutaki Nagi formula. And then they just sort of plug that into some quantum information machinery and sort of argued that there had to be some way that these operators were encoded. And they sort of didn't give an explicit rule for if I have an operator by little b, how do I, how do I make an operator by big b that, that does the same thing for a given boundary region? Um, so what I'm going to talk about is just a, a yeah, there's various ways you can do this that we know now. I'm just going to talk about a particular one called the PETS map, um, which is just a, a general purpose. It comes from this theory of quantum error correction. It's just a general purpose way of doing error correction, sort of roughly speaking, whenever error correction is possible. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, let, me, let me explain how it works by using a very simple setup. What we're going to imagine is we're going to have a vacuum prepared by some Euclidean path integral. And we're going to have some spin, some qubit just sitting in the middle of this. Okay, this is really just for convenience. The, 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 this thing works very generally. Uh, some spin sort of sitting here, just particle with a world line. And that has some, some state. Can maybe make it start in the zero state, right? And then what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to apply some operator. It's going to sort of just act in some region B. It's going to be, again, my favorite example of the union of two intervals. So it's going to do some complicated thing here. OK. And then what do we want to find is that magically, when we insert a bra, we find that this qubit is now naturally in the state one rather than the state zero. Okay, so we're going to flip the spin of this qubit by doing this very complicated thing on the boundary region B. Okay, so how might one construct an operator that does this? Let's say you weren't only allowed to act on region B, you're allowed to act on the entire boundary. Then what's the stupidest operator that would possibly do the job? Um, well, it's an operator that just looks like this. Looks like a bra where the qubit is in the zero state, followed by ket with the qubit in the one state. OK, so if I sandwich this into here, then what you'd find is that this thing starts in the zero state and goes up here and ends in the zero state, so we get an inner product of one. You know, it, it matches up. But then this new qubit is prepared in the one state, and indeed up there, we get the one state. Okay, so, so this is a boundary operator that's gluing in new boundary conditions. It's a boundary operator that changes something in the middle of the world. That's the power of philosophy. Secretly, the bulk is encoded in the back. Um, but of course, that's, that's kind of too trivial. Um, say, so, oh, oh, let's call that operator the operator psi one, psi zero. Okay, we're going to make this state be psi 
zero. This gate is psi one. And it is sort of trivial fact that this operator will take one to another. But we now, that, that's an operator that acts on the tower boundary. We want an operator that only acts on region B. What's the way you turn an operator on the entire space time into one that only acts on some, some reduced part of it? Well, the simplest thing you could possibly do, stupidest thing, is just to take a partial trace up over the stuff you're not allowed to act on. Okay? Um, so that's sort of the, the most trivial way you could make an operator out of this that only acts on B. Um, and that doesn't quite work. Sometimes it like sort of works, the particular sense of the word works. Um, and it turns out I really don't have to change this very much to, to make something that actually does work in a large number of cases. Whenever, whenever this operator is in the entanglement wedge, really. Uh, and that's all I have to do. So I have to insert sigma b to the minus a half here, and a sigma b to the minus a half here. So what is sigma b? Just the trace over the bar of just psi zero, psi zero, plus psi one, psi one. Okay. So, yeah, I claim that if I put in psi zero here, then the output will be equal to psi one. Okay, the qubit will have magically got flipped by this operator, which acted only on region B, but just some complicated operator on that red region in the diagram. Um, how does this work? Uh, where am I up to here? So the argument is very closely related to the, the argument for the quantum extremal surface prescription. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into detail, but I'm just going to try and give the spirit of it. OK, the point is that we started with some state, OK? And we had region the bar. Yeah, and we, we, we're going to evaluate the matrix elements. So we started with a state at the bottom down there. Maybe it's way too big, but never mind. And we want to end, and we want to see that this qubit that started in state one ended up, state zero ends up in state one. Okay. And we're not going to apply any operator to region B bar. So these things are just going to get glued to these things without any operator being inserted. But we are going to apply an operator to region B. What are we going to do? Uh, so the operator we want to apply is going to be sigma b the operator we want to apply is sigma b to the minus a half trace of the bar of by one by zero sigma b minus a half you don't know how to evaluate that using the path integral. So just as before, we're just going to use a replica trick. We're going to instead insert sigma b's to the n, and then we're going to take analytically continue n to minus a half. OK? Um, so if I have n sigma b's, each has a bra and a ket. And the qubits here can be in any state. Oops. Can be in any state i, either zero or one, but they have to be in the same state, right? Because we had psi zero, psi zero plus psi one, psi one. So we're, we're summing over ones with zeros there and ones with ones there. And so we're going to glue. Here and here, into here and here. 
and then we're going glue we're going to have n copies of here these so that the you know we we really have i'm not going to draw them all but we really have n of these that get glued into one another but then we're going to take this last one and this last one gets glued into this bra size zero here okay so let me draw that bra zero Okay, so this gets glued onto this. But now the the region B bar of this bra size it zero gets glued onto the region B bar of the cat size one, because we've got a Tarshu trace. So the green bits here get glued in the green bits here. And then finally, we have another sigma b to the n. Again, we have sort of j in the bras and j in the kets that can be either 0 or 1, but it has to be the same as one another. And the region b of this thing gets glued on to stuff here. And we have n of them all glued together. Uh, so, so glue. this gets glued to this, and this gets glued to this. Then this gets glued to this gets glued to this, and this gets glued to this. And then finally, we're done with the operator, so we now need to want to glue it into. We applied our operator. We want to glue it into our bra. Uh, so this part here gets glued into this part here. Okay. And for the same reasons that uh, things, everything happened with quantum extreme surface prescription, what's going to happen is that these gluing procedures are going to extend into the bulk. And you're going to have conical singularities at some surface. We'll end up defining the boundary of the entanglement wedge. And everything between its respective boundary region and that surface gets glued the same way the boundary region does. OK. So now let's look at what happens to this particle world line. It starts down here in state 0, goes up through here. But when it reaches here, it gets glued over to here, ends up here. So what we find is that i has to be equal to zero. Okay. Same thing happens in all the copies of this. We find that there's a new particle world line starting here, also in state zero. <coughs> Finally, this thing ends up going up here. It was in state zero, it's ending up in state zero, so it's fine. We, we get a one there. If we'd had sort of a state one here or something, then we'd get a zero, but we don't. You know, that would get killed by our operator as it should, um, but because it's zero, it survives. And then we have a new particle world line starting here, state one, goes up through here, ends up here. We find the j's all have to equal one. Eventually, we get, we get this particle world line, comes up in state one, comes up through here, and we get a non zero answer if and only if we had state one and end up in the OK, so something has happened. This, this operator gives a non-zero thing, even only if we have zero down here and one up here. So it sort of seems to have worked. Uh, but we still want to know that it gives the answer one if that happens. Um, and uh, the answer is it does just for the same magic of analytic continuation that we had before. OK, so for integer n, these geometries will be very back reacted. You need to have conical singularities around all these things. But when we take n goes to a half, then the total number of these things, we had n, n here, we had n here, OK? We had 1 here, we had 1 here. This is bras and kets combined. Um, so we have 2n plus 2 bras and 2n plus 2 kets. Plug n equals minus a half into that, and magically, we get one bra and one ket, and so the geometry is unback reacted 
And it turns out everything canceled out and you magically find that this operator that acted only in this red region, region B, has flipped the spin of this thing in the center. Um, okay. Uh, so that is entanglement wedge reconstruction. Um, yeah, uh, that's, that's sort of one particular way to see that it's possible. Um, there's a lot of other ways you can do it. You can use something called molecular flow. It goes back to, to Faulkner and Lukovitz. Um, it sort of you know, has some advantages and disadvantages in terms of how easy it is to see what's going on. But the great thing about this thing is that it's just an a explicit rule for constructing an operator and it just works. Um, so yeah, I only read it in this one special case, but it's just a, a general general rule for, for how you apply operators. Um, okay. So the final thing I want to talk about, and I'm not going to talk about this much, partly because I don't have time, but also because I think the, the you know, if you really understand all the other stuff that's been talked about, then, then there's not that much to say, uh, is how this all can be applied to the black hole information. Which obviously is pretty cool. It gives us the page curve, it gives us uh, Hayden Presco, it gives us all sorts of stuff like that. Um, so, okay, I'm going to talk about uh, a particularly simple model of a black hole uh, that sort of has a information paradox, um, sometimes called the East Coast replica wormholes model, so it actually also appeared in our paper, the West Coast paper. Um, and uh, before that, it had already appeared in, in, yeah, I guess it was originally East Coast people, but it was a different paper to the East Coast Replica Wormholes paper where it first appeared. Uh, and that's the following. You consider making an equilibrium two-sided black hole um, just by, that is in equilibrium with a two-sided thermal bar. And you do that as follows. You use a path integral where you have a non-gravitational path integral on sort of this whole, this, this sort of plane with a chunk cut out of it, okay? And then you use a gravitational path integral on, you turn on gravity in this region here, okay? That gives us a, a two-sided black hole um, that will be in the thermal field double state except it will be a thermal field double state that's in equilibrium with the bar. Okay, this, this thing, so this is just a, a non-gravitational matter path integral over this region. Okay, so we still have matter fields and they'll be in a thermal state uh, on, you know, thermal field double state on these two infinite half lines um, that are there. And then we have a, a two-sided black hole in thermal field double state sitting here. Okay, so this is a Euclidean geometry. Um, but we can analytically continue to Lorentzian time. And that gives us Penrose diagram that looks like this. We have a two-sided ADS two-dimensional black hole. Actually, it doesn't have a singularity there, so let me erase that, but we have a two-sided black hole um, looks like this. And then it is coupled with one plus one dimensional flat space. So it looks like this. Oops, take off the page a bit, but this. Okay, so we have gravity in this whole middle region. And we have no gravity to the side. And these black holes will radiate, they'll radiate Hawking radiation here and here. And because we have transparent boundary conditions, the matter can just free, freely flow across into the non-gravitational region. Um, then the black hole will, will, there's also radiation going in. So the black hole won't lose or gain energy, but it will uh, become more entangled with the bar over time, right? The, this radiation is entangled with stuff here. And this stuff escapes into the bath. And the stuff in the interior of the black hole does not. So you get an increasing amount of entanglement between the interior of the black hole and this thermal bath. And eventually, 
that becomes bigger than two times the Beckinson Hawking entropy, and you get an information paradox. Okay, so what we want to see is how that we we can we can solve that, how we can see that actually the the entropy stops getting bigger um, when it becomes equal to the twice the Beckinson Hawking entropy of the black hole. Um, okay. Yeah, why, why twice the Bexstein Hawking entropy of the black hole? Because we, we have, you know, we have the left side of the black hole and the right side of the black hole. If they're both in a thermal state, then you can you can have a, a unentangled thermal state, then maximum entropy you can have is twice the Bexstein Hawking. Okay. Um, so we're gonna do that by just calculating the entropy of say the the matter fields in the bath in some large region of the bath that maybe goes off to infinity. And we'll maybe take the other side of the bath as well. Okay, so we're gonna look at the entropy of all those matter fields. And the, the key point is that exactly like in uh, calculations of the, the quantum extremal surface prescription, the way to do this is using the replica trick where we, we just have you know, we, we, we're computing the entropies of these things, so we, we glue the boundary conditions together there. Um, this is Lorentzian, so it's sort of complex uh, from a Euclidean point of view, complex geometry, um, but that's fine. Works in the same way. And the key point is that just like in the quantum extremal surface description, we can have a co-dimension to fixed point show up in the gravitational region, okay? Um, and that co-dimension two fixed point will, will act as an extra, extra branch cut. Um, and when we compute the entropy, we, we, we need to take into account the fact these extra branch cuts. Um, so in two dimensions, then co-dimension two is just a point. And what you in fact have happen at these very late times, is that you get an extra you get a surface chi, a quantum extremal surface chi that appears in this calculation that is sort of somewhere up here, and somewhere up here. Okay. So then it's very close to the horizon. As I've drawn it here, it doesn't look that close to the horizon, but it's actually just the, the, the radius is like order G Newton larger than the, the radius of the horizon. Um, and it's sort of on the same time slice as these blue dots, which is sort of the last part of the bath that we included uh, that we're in our, our entropy calculation, the thing we're trying to calculate here. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, so, so why does this, this give us, so, so I should have said the, the you know, naive answer uh, for this entropy, it's just that all this stuff is thermal and it just grows and grows and grows. Um, and that corresponds to doing replica trick calculation where you don't have any fixed points, right? If I, if I don't have any fixed points and the gravity part doesn't really matter, it just cancels the entropy. Um, so why does having these, these emergent fixed points in the, the, in the, the quotient of geometry um, change the entropy? Well, it means that the matter thing I'm computing, right, that we're computing trace of rho little b to the n, that's the, the matter part of the partition function. Uh, what is little b? Well, it still includes these blue regions, but because we have these extra fixed points, then it also includes a region in the middle here. Okay, because this region isn't connected to anything else, it's become known as an island. But it's really just exactly the same, you know, it's just a region in the bulk that's, that's bounded by the, the fixed point. Um, exactly like we had in, in you know, the two intervals in vacuum. So now we want to calculate uh, you know, trace of rho little b to the n, and eventually we want to calculate the, the entropy, the bulk entropy S. Of little b. What is this? Well, I'm not really going to calculate it properly, but the key point is that this sort of super, super large order one over G Newton entropy just comes from having 
all these interior modes that are entangled between ones that escaped into the bath and ones that are in the interior of the black hole. It doesn't look like that many here, but you've got to remember that we had to wait a sort of order one of G Newton time um, for this to, to happen, for the black hole to equilibrate. So we have an order one over G Newton number of sort of bow pairs shared between inside and outside. So if we didn't have these emergent twist fields, um, emergent, emergent like fixed points, then that order one of G Newton number of modes would give an entropy that is order one of G Newton, this, this really big semi-classical entropy that's paradoxical. But now those are just entanglement between one part of the blue region and another part of the blue region. So they don't contribute. So really the entropy of this whole root blue region, just because the whole bulk state is pure, is equal to the entropy of this sort of green region. And that's just some order one thing, right? It doesn't have any of this sort of super long interior or super long interval in the bath that are intact. So we find that, that this sort of SB is order one and uh, what about the area? Well, you know, we sort of have two, two of these dots. So the area is equal to, of the fixed point is equal to twice the horizon area. Remember I said that these things are very close to the horizon. So the final answer is that the sort of actual replicatory answer for the entropy of this bath region is, um, Two a horizon over four g newton plus four to one corrections from the bulk entropy term. So this is exactly what we needed it to be to not be paradoxical. So great, um, everything worked out. Um, so that's fine. The sort of quantum extremal surface like rule, um, you know, the replica trick when you take account the fixed points gives you the right answer. Uh, but it's worth thinking for a moment about what these, these geometries actually, uh, what the unquotiented geometries actually look like, right? In the quotiented geometry, you just have these two fixed points, but what does that correspond to in the unquotiented geometry at say integer n? Um, and that's where replica wormholes come in. So I'm just going to draw a Euclidean thing, even though we actually needed this really long Lorentzian time to make the, the, that saddle with non-trivial fixed points dominate. Um, but I'll just draw what the Euclidean thing would look like topologically if it exists. Um, so let's do it for n equals two. Okay, so we had our non-gravitational part. And we had, we're going to have two bras and we're going to have two cats. Okay. And so we're wanting to calculate the entropy of so this region and this region. Okay, so that gets glued to the other copy over. Uh, so this gets glued to here. Similarly, this stuff gets glued to this stuff. Okay, uh, and then, you know, up to the boundary, this bit that we, we didn't find the entropy of very close to the boundary of the gravitational region doesn't get Lead to the next copy over because we're not including it in the entropy of the things we compute. Okay, so now we fill in this uh, boundary conditions. Now we fill them in with gravity. And uh, the point is, you know, we're going to get sort of some half disk associated to each of these things. The question is how they're going to get glued together. So the bit near the boundary gets glued just like the, the, the boundary itself. So it doesn't get glued to the next operator over. 
but this bit in the middle that's inside these fixed points does get glued to the right where well, it does get glued glued across because that's what the fixed points are telling us telling us there's a branch point there branch cut there so this gets glued to this and this gets glued to this okay so now let's forget about the non-gravitational region and just look at the gravitational region what is that topology well you know we have one boundary here that's a disk and then we sort of have you know, half disk with hole cut out of it glued to half disk with hole cut out of it so that sort of looks like a trumpet and then we have another disk from the other one and they're just glued together through this quick region sorry about that uh so what has happened here okay um Okay, so this sort of looks like an Einstein Rosen bridge, but it isn't. It's because this is the full space time rather than the uh, um, rather than just a spatial cut through space time. Okay, so this is a very different sense of wormhole from Einstein Rosen bridge wormhole, but it is a wormhole, it's a space time wormhole. Um, so you can think of this if I look at some spatial cuts through this, yeah, you know, it's a it's a instanton that's a topological change in the, the space-time geometry. So here, if I took a slice through here, spatial slice, and it seems like this boundary is connected to this boundary, and this boundary is connected to this boundary. But if I move forwards in Euclidean time, then now this boundary is connected to this boundary, and this to this, and then they go back the way they were before. Right? So there's, there's, it's like a quantum tunneling effect where you tunnel from, from one set of things being connected to a different topology back to the third topology. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, so that's, that's roughly what these wormholes are about. Um, great, I have almost perfect timing. So I'm really just gonna make my final comment, um, which is, what does entanglement wedge tell us about this situation? Well, remember, let me actually go back to the previous slide. Remember, entanglement wedge reconstruction tells you that any operator sitting in the region little b is secretly encoded in the boundary region. Okay, in this case, the boundary region, which isn't really a boundary region, but it works in exactly the same way, is all this Hawking radiation here. That tells you that any operator that sits in this blue region, uh, is in, we can replace by an operator acting on the bar. An operator just acts on the Hawking radiation. So this is exactly what's called black hole complementarity. Also, you've got a more radical version of black hole complementarity called A equals RB or EO equals EPR. Um, it's saying that see, like everything in the black hole is really just encoded in the Hawking radiation in a complicated way. And you can do the, the sort of pet map calculations explicitly, and you, you do indeed find this. You can just do some operator on the Hawking radiation that's defined, defined in terms of these sort of matrix elements of states, and you look at its action, so like its effect on the state is calculated using a bulk path integral, and you find that, that because of these sort of wormholes connecting together different copies, then its, its effect is to change something deep in the interior of time. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna talk any more about that because it's, it's you know, I really didn't want the focus of this thing to be on, on information paradox. I just want to give the basic idea how it goes across. Um, so yeah, I think that is my, my two hours. Uh, so yeah, any questions? So uh, thank you, Jeff, for uh, finishing exactly on time. You are very perfect. <laughs> yeah, and it was really a nice talk because uh, uh, like the other talk that I have listened uh, already in the conferences and streams, it was very short. So it, it, it was a little bit hard to connect sometimes, but this was really clear. And I'm... Uh, thankful to you that you have did, uh, you didn't lose the energy throughout the talk it was really nice yeah now i'm going for a nap <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, like, yeah, uh, like, yeah, like I, I believe that that will be helpful for other people, those who are following this uh, uh, direction. And uh, it's quite a big material he uh, actually uh, discussed today. And uh, it, uh, so, and uh, you guys can ask small questions to him because it, he's already tired. But if you have okay. some small things, uh, ask, ask whatever questions you have. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask a question, please? Yep. Uh, uh, in the uh, first, uh, uh, in, uh, when you discussed the uh, uh, retrokinetic surface and the uh, uh, quantum extremal surface or entanglement wedge, uh, uh, you seem to take a, a co-dimension two boundary yes. subregion, right? Uh, uh, the boundary subregion is co-dimension two. It's co-dimension two from a bold point of view. It's co-dimension one from uh, the boundary. Yeah. 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 Uh, is it okay to take codimension one subregion? Uh, you mean like a, a um, yeah, so good question. Let me erase some of this stuff. By the way, if anyone can tell me afterwards how you can just automatically delete this whiteboard on an iPad, um, I'd appreciate it. I'm using a white bag iPad with Zoom for the first time. I just got it. Oh, so uh, really so there is any restriction is number of pages or something like that? Yeah, apparently you can only have 12 whiteboards. Um, oh, and, okay. I don't uh, know. Yeah, <laughs> never reached that many before. Okay, um, good. So, yeah, more black. More yellow. Yeah, right. You could, you could ask, for example, about the, the entropy of sort of some like blob here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, what does the entropy of that mean? Well, it means, presumably what we mean by it is we mean by the entropy of the algebra generated by, by operators in that little blob, right? Um, and in fact, the, the operators in that, that little blob give you more than just the, the information in the blob itself. They actually give you the sort of whole uh, causal Darman, the whole whole boundary domain of dependence associated with that little blob. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're really not just computing this this dark thing. And this is true, by the way, with the co-dimension two region. If, if I if I just say look to some particular surface that like wiggled like this, then really what I mean is the the entropy associated with this causal diamond. Okay, uh -huh. um, uh -huh. and this causal diamond has a has a, a spatial boundary that is. Uh, boundary co-dimension two, bulk co-dimension three, uh, and so the the homology constraint goes. Yeah, the reattacking ugly surface goes through exactly the same way. You, know, you can think of this blob as just being replaced by a single spatial slice, um, but yeah, really the data is in this causal diamond. Yeah, yeah, it indeed works in a uh, Euclidean path integral. But uh, for example, if it con uh, analytically continue to a uh, Lorentzian signature. So, so, so actually, I think it's less clear to me in Euclidean path integral what it would mean. This is this is very much in Lorentzian path integral, right? Oh, really? Um, yeah. So, so the the it's causal diamond in, in Euclidean path integral. I think if you have algebra of operators at different Euclidean times, uh, the trouble is you can't really you can't really like take. Because out of order, out of t Euclidean time order, things don't really make sense. Then I'm not sure that's a, that's a meaningful thing to talk about. Um, but in Lorentzian, you certainly can, and and then you can talk about the algebra of operators generated by this these operators in Lorentzian time, and it's it's causal diamond. Um, uh, does so, it so yeah. Uh, is it does it make sense to consider a uh, time-like separation? Uh, in, for uh, entanglement entropy, yeah. So um, usually, yeah, uh, so, so I I'm could. You mean you mean like a, a, so if I have some subregion like that? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So there is a theorem called the time-like tube theorem uh, that says that in this case, uh, actually, the algebra generated by that thing is the 
the whole causal diamond like, like this. Uh, so in fact, that the, the entanglement entropy associated that time like thing is the same as the entanglement entropy associated this baseline uh, twice. It's actually exactly the same. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Same calculation. Um, so, so one thing I'm not super clear on actually is, um, let's say I just had a little bit up here, a little bit down here. Um, so in depending on the theory, the algebra associated with that thing may not be the entire causal diamond like this. Um, so say if I have a free theory, then I can have stuff that just goes straight through here without being seen by either of those two points, right? Um, so I think it may be the case that, so, so there is a thing called hard duality, um, which basically says, you know, theory that satisfies hard duality, um, then everything in this causal diamond is actually in the algebra of, of just these two points, um, or like open, little open regions around these two points. Um, I am, yeah, I, 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 I am, I don't know whether that hard duality is true for n equals four CPM mills, for example, or even whether it's like known anything about it or anything like that. So I, I think there is some interesting, I, I think, I think there's some interesting unknown questions about if I, I have sort of certain time-like regions. Um, but certainly a connected time-like region, then I think the entanglement entropy is well-defined, but it's just the same as the entanglement entropy of a particular spatial region. Yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Thanks. So any more question? I don't think so. If uh, Immediately ask. I will not extend this for long. Okay, if there is no question, just please unmute yourself and give a clap for him for giving such an outstanding talk. Thank you. Yeah, so, okay. So have a nice uh, uh, stay. Probably you were uh, like in holidays right now. Sort of, sort of. Sort of. I'm trying yeah. to get a paper out actually. Yeah. Uh, so next yeah. month you are okay. going to join your job. So yeah, yes, exactly. Yes, yep. for that, and have a safe yep. and uh, healthy life. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So I will try. And, uh, so your this Stanford email ID will be remain for some time. Hello. Sorry, say that again. Yeah, I'm saying that uh, your Stanford email ID will remain. Yeah, it should work for, yeah. I, I think I can get it forwarded to another address for at least a year or something. So, okay. it, it, no, I, yeah, assume that works for you. Yeah. But my Berkeley address is just the same address, but with Berkeley rather than Stanford. So. Okay, okay. I will contact you. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks a lot.